Welcome to the Books of Titans podcast, where I seek truth in the world's great books. I'm your host, Eric Rostad, coming to you from the beautiful Books of Titans studio in Franklin, Tennessee. My goal is to read 200 of the great books over the next 10 years and share what I'm learning. I'll talk a bit about each book, tie ideas together from a variety of genres, and share the one thing I always hope to remember from each of the great books. Today I'm going to cover the poetry of Sappho. This is great book number 10, and I read two different translations. So the first is Sappho, Stung with Love, Poems and Fragments by Aaron Puchigan. And the second one is If Not Winter, Fragments of Sappho, translation by Anne Carson. These were books 33 and 34 from my 2023 reading list. Well, I jumped ahead a little bit to read Sappho because it was mentioned in Herodotus's histories. And what I decided to do while I was reading those histories was just to divide it up. There's there's nine books. They get to be a little bit longer. And uh, so I just decided to insert some of the great books and other books in between those the Herodotus history books. And so I'm loving Herodotus. I'm loving the, the histories, but uh, just thought it'd be kind of interesting to, to throw some stuff in there. So I'm, I'm doing Sappho right now, uh, jumping ahead. Uh, Sappho should come after Homer, and I have not read Homer yet. The reason is that the version, the translation I want to read of Iliad by Emily Wilson does not come out until the end of September. I tried really hard to get a, an advanced copy. I'm not cool enough. I did not get one. And so thus I'm reading Sappho instead of Homer, but I will be reading Homer soon. I kind of wish I had, I had waited to read her until after Homer because there are some connections that, that I'll get into here, but uh, let's, let's just dig in and, and find out who Sappho is first. She's writing about 100 years after Homer, and last week I covered Hesiod and Theogony, and Hesiod and Homer were contemporaries, and they're just rough dates here. They're around 700 BC. Sappho is born around 630 BC, probably writing around 620, or, uh, 610, 600 BC, and so she's 100 years after, after Homer. She was from the Greek island of Lesbos, and if you look at a map, Lesbos looks like it should be part of Turkey. It's it's right next to it, but it, it is a Greek isle. Uh, it's a Greek island. And Sappho was sometimes called the 10th muse. So there were nine muse. And so she kind of got like an honorary muse of uh, just being so amazing and so beloved by so many, whether it was philosopher, emperor, all people for 2,500 years of history, they have just fallen in love with Sappho's poetry. And so she's called the 10th muse because of that. Anne Carson in her book in the introduction says that Sappho was a musician first and a poet second, and that her poetry would have been lyric, which means it was composed to be sung with the lyre. The, the instrument, like the harp-like instrument, uh, you'll, you'll see uh, David in the, in the Bible was said to, to play the lyre. And so it's kind of a, a handheld harp. Um, the sound of it is, is like a harp. I'll play a, a, a sample of, of a lyre here just in a, in a minute. But it, it sounds to me like a harp. It, it almost has a guitar kind of sound as well. Uh, so I just think it's funny that I never realized that the word lyric came from lyre. And so a lyric is something that's meant to be sung with the lyre. And another thing I didn't know is that aphrodisiac and Aphrodite are connected as well. These things seem so obvious now on the on the flip side of, of knowing the connection. But um, those are two things I came across in reading about Sappho. We also know that Sappho had a brother, uh, Charicus. I don't, don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, but I came across his name in The Rise and Fall of Ancient Egypt, a, a book I read earlier this year when I did a, my deep dive into the writings of ancient Egypt. And he comes up in some of the poems. He's in love with this courtesan named Doricha, who is in Egypt, and he is a wine merchant. And so he travels to Egypt as a wine merchant, and he falls for this woman, Doricha. Sappho doesn't like her, uh, and you, you, read, you read some of that in, in her, her poems. Strabo, he had a quote about Sappho, and I want to read this because it uh, kind of sums up what a lot of people have thought about her. Sappho is, is an amazing thing, for we know in all of recorded history not one woman who can even come close to rivaling her in the grace of her poetry, end quote. 
So what is a lyre? What, what is this instrument in, in that, that would have accompanied Sappho when she was singing these, these lyrics, these, these poems, these lyric poems to uh, when she's singing these? Uh, because these would have been or, uh, oral. They would have been, been sung in Greek, and they would have been oral. And it's not like she combined this, this series of poems into a, a poetry collection, but uh, these were, were sung and probably meant to be passed along that way, or, or that's how she would have thought they would have been, been passed along. So what is a lyre? Uh, it's, it's an instrument similar to a harp. I'm going to play a little sample here just so you can get a, get a feel for what it's like. And this was a, a, apparently an older instrument. So I, I, I mean, it, it, from, from what the YouTube video said of this, it, 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 it's probably a, a good estimation of what that instrument would have sounded like. Uh, it, it reminded me of the guitar. I mean, just, you know, some, some sort of an instrument in the background that can be plucked or kind of strummed to accompany singing. And so I think our, our nearest connection would be an acoustic guitar uh, in, in terms of, of what the music we hear on a regular basis. But I, the other thing I thought of right away is just, it's very calming. I mean, it's just a, you just kind of imagine sitting there listening to a song being sung to that and just being a, a very intimate thing, a very, um, uh, just, it, it would just touch a lot of heartstrings uh, of, of listening to, to this accompanying, uh, some be beautiful poetry. Um, so a, a, lyre, a, a, a lyre poem, um, th there are some that she wrote about the lyre itself. And so I, I just want to read a couple in, you know, just kind of quick lines here. Um, yes, radiant lyre, speak to me, become a voice. And, and in that one, she's kind of personifying the lyre. She's like, it's have, it's becoming, it's becoming, pers it's, it's becoming something. And it's, it's, it's almost, it's becoming an instrument It's becoming, uh, part of that lyric. Um, and then an, another one, she says, far more sweet sounding than a lyre, golden than golden, more golden than gold. Uh, and end quote. So she has some about the lyre and just, uh, I like that idea of it being personified of, of it, of it being part of her voice that is part of these, these lyrics. We obviously don't have the, the sound of, of what she would have been playing. Uh, there's no music that was written down either. We, we just have the, the lyric side of it, the, the words. These are love poems and they are, they are erotic poems. Uh, but it's not like, it's not this blatant, like dirty erotic. It's, it's one, it's one of those where you, you read it and you're like, Oh, oh, okay. I, I get it. I get it. So it, it, at least for me, it just takes a minute. And, and then you're like, Oh, wait, is she really talking about that? It, if you've ever read the song of Solomon, it, it's kind of like that. I mean, you could, you could read the song of Solomon and pretend it's about animals and fruits, but you're not paying attention if, if you're doing that. And it's, that's not what it's about, but it's not, you don't read the song of Solomon and think, well, this is a really dirty document. It's not, it's not that kind of sense. It's just, I came away reading Sappho thinking if, if this subject is going to be written about, this is how it should be written about. Uh, the one kind of awkward thing I learned is that some of these would have been sung outside of the wedding chamber. So there, the couple has just gotten married and then everyone at the wedding is like, okay, you guys go do your thing. And then they would have sung. And some of these were like, uh, some, you know, I, I just said that some of these are like, this is the, the non dirty kind of erotic, but she has some poems that are, are just kind of like, you can imagine like a men's locker room type of thing, but these would have been sung outside of the wedding chamber while the cup, the couple's in there doing their, their first thing. And th there's people singing these outside of the door, like to make noise so that you don't hear what's going on. Uh, and it's just kind of a funny thing to think about, but she uh, she references Homer a lot in in her poems, and that's one reason I wish I would have read Homer before. But she's kind of she's going from these these epic stories, but but changing them in a way. And so she'll you'll recognize some of the things that are going on in these poems, but it's kind of a shift from how Homer's writing about them. And so I'll get into that a little bit later as well. 
uh, actually, this here's a, here's a quote. This is in the introduction. This is Puchigan. Uh, he states that Sappho fits squarely into the development of poetry from Homeric epic to Greek lyric. End quote. And and I will talk about this more later because it stuck out to me so much. But the basics here is that we in in hundred years before we're talking Homeric epic. We're talking these these larger than life epics. You're talking about the gods. You're talking about these 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 men that are doing you know heroic things. And then you go in in what the direction that Sappho is taking things here is is into Greek lyric and more of a personal thing a, a personal experience with with love or with with the gods and and so that's kind of a shift that that takes place with with her writing uh, as far as her work and what we have of it we have about 10% of everything she wrote and that is mostly in fragments and so scholars think that she composed nine books of lyrics nine books and we only have one poem out of those nine books that has survived complete. Only one poem of those nine books. The rest are in fragments. And when I say fragments, some of them we only have one word. And when you read the Anne Carson translation, the way she presents the book is that some, I mean, some, some, some pages are like one word. I, it's just a huge blank space in one word or, or a few words. And that's how she presents the book. And it's just, it's an incredible thing because these were once full poems, full lyrics. And now we, all we have left is one word. A lot of these were written on papyrus and the the papyrus just got decimated over the years. And what we do have uh, are kind of from two sources. And so the first source would have just been what was preserved on papyrus. And the funny thing is a lot of the preservation was because the the papyrus would have been used and placed inside the tombs of the mummies. And so there was actually, they actually, we actually have some of the, of Sappho, Sappho, because it was included in a mummified crocodile's tomb. And so we, we have one piece from that. So that's the first thing is just anything that would have been preserved on papyrus, which is not a whole lot. The second thing is so many people loved her that we, she's cited all over the place. And so there's a lot of citations from, from ancient authors. And those are gold because they were citing like large chunks of her poetry that we no longer have. And so we can, we can, we can look at those and, and maybe if we have fragments, we can say, oh, okay, here's this word from, from what this person quoted 2,000 years ago or 2,200 years ago or something. So that's, that's kind of a cool thing. So that, that's how we have these. And, and again, we only have 10% of them. So there's a few different types of, of hymns in, in writing. Uh, the first is just a, a regular, like a, a hymn. And there's kind of a question of, of are these hymns to gods? Are they, um, are they, are they love him? Like, I, what, how do, how do we place these? Uh, it reminded me a lot of, of, of in Inhed, in Hedawana when I, when I read her works in, in, in Hedawana was, um, gosh, 1800 years before, um, before Sappho. And, but she was writing hymns and, and these, these invocations and, and, and entreaties, which are some of what Sappho is doing here as well. And then there's another thing called, ep, ep, oh, I'm going to butcher this, Epithamalia. And that is a poem celebrating a marriage. And so that's another form. There's also a little bit of wisdom literature. And in one of the introductions, they talk about this wisdom literature. And, and I, you think like uh, the book of Proverbs or even works and days that I covered last week by Hesiod. You have this wisdom literature. It's, it's these pithy kind of sayings, these just quick impactful sayings that really can help you in life if you're in a in a bind and you just kind of one of these things come to mind the way i like to think about it is we all have family members who who pull out these statements at opportune times and they're just kind of full of these like wisdom sayings uh and and in in a way it's it is an education because it, it gives you a guideline of of which to live so that's part of of what sappho is doing here as well as I mentioned, I read these two versions. The first one is the Penguin Classics version, and this is the one with the uh, by Puchigan, the translation and introduction by Puchigan. What is cool about this one is that on the left side of the page you have a description, and then on the right hand, uh, on the right side of the book is the actual translated poetry. That was helpful, and I'm glad I read this one first because. 
I when it when it comes to poetry, I I have the poetic intelligence of a mule. And so I need all the help I can get. So just having these explanations right next to the actual poems, very helpful. I suggest, you know, if you're if you're in the same boat as me, you need help with poetry. That that's a good translation to start with. The Ann Carson translation, this one was neat because it had the actual Greek on the left and then on the right was the English. I took a couple semesters of Greek in college. I've forgotten almost all of it, but I know enough to like be able to pick out the letters and stuff. And so it was fun to just see the Greek there, kind of pick out some of the words and see the same word used in different situations and that kind of thing. And then also just to like try to try to sound out some of them. I'm going to try to read one of uh, one line of one later, but uh, so that was neat. And so, especially if you've had any Greek, you, you may want to check out the Ann Carson translation, just because it has uh, both the Greek and the English where the, the uh, Puchigan one does not have any of the Greek in there uh, for reading stats. The, the first one, the Penguin classics, Puchigan translation is 139 pages with the introduction. And that took me three hours and 56 minutes to read over three days. The Ann Carson translation is 355 pages, but as I mentioned, some of those pages are just a few words. And then the, you know, the other half of that is uh, a lot of Greek pages, which I just kind of skipped over. So that one took me less time, even though it was it was longer. That one took me two hours and 11 minutes to read and, over two days. And the reason I mention that is just so you know how long it might take you to, to read these books. I read rather slowly. I'm taking lots of notes and that kind of thing. Point is, I read both of these within the past week, so they're both fresh. And so what I, I want to do in the rest of this episode is just talk about some of the 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 lyrics, the poetry that stuck out to me in the next segment. And then in, in segment three, I'll cover the one thing, my, my one key takeaway from, from reading Sappho and, and learning about her life. Last week I covered Hesiod and I covered Theogony and Works and Days. And my main takeaway, my, the one thing that I couldn't stop thinking about was just this, the way that he personified the gods and, and, and how, how the gods were viewed in the sense that uh, wind was personified. There, there, was, there was a god behind that. Um, the, the example I gave was the, uh, the example of right. And they said that the gods gave mankind right, and that set us apart from the animals where we knew right from wrong. But right was personified. And so if you didn't, if you weren't doing right, you were injuring the god right. You weren't just injuring yourself or your, your fellow person. You were injuring the idea, the person, the god of, of right. And that was just such an interesting way to think about it because I, I never think of, of these things, wind, pain, fear, as as gods. But one thing that I came across, uh, and this was, was in some of the notes along with Sappho. So uh, just one of those things, you know, it's on the top of my, my head, it's in my brain. And so I came across this and it helped me to understand what was going on with that, that personification. And, and so here's, here's what, uh, what I came across. So a couple things. First is, the, is it said, uh, for Sappho, the power of love is a god as power often is for the ancient Greeks, end quote. And this was a quote of a, of a quote. So this was from Charles Siegel. And he said, for Sappho, the power of love is a god, as power often is for the ancient Greeks. So that power of love uh, w w was a god. It just wasn't this idea of, of power. And then the second thing is um, uh, a quote in the, the Puchigan version. And, and it says, in response to God crafted product of the tor tortoise shell, come to me, liar, be vol voluble. So that is a po uh, lyric from Sappho. God crafted product of the tortoise shell, come to me, liar, be voluble. And so she's talking about the the liar and be voluble. So so she's she's giving it. Uh, she's personifying the the instrument. She's personifying her her liar, and then. What the comment is on this is it says, this is an example of the sweet effect, the ascription of conscious choice to things incapable of it produces, end quote. And that's, that's a quote by Hermogenes. It, let me just read that again. The, this is an example of the sweet effect, the ascription of conscious choice to things incapable of it produces. And that's exactly what struck me about Hesiod's book last week is just that 
ascription of conscious thought. So I've never thought in my life of wind having conscious thought or fear having conscious thought. Uh, but these over 300 gods presented in Theogony by Hesiod, th- it's, it's like, it's like these idea the, these things that we think of as, as ideas and things are given conscious choice. And it's just a unique, it's just a neat way to think about it. And so this helped give me some, some words to, uh, what, what I came across last week. Um, so let me, let me get into some reading, some, um, some Sappho here. I just want you to get a feel for, for what, what it's like. And so these are some of the, the poems that stuck out to me most. And so let me get my lyre ready here. Uh, I'm going to pull this out and, and uh, let me get it going before I start reading here. So just one second. All right, here, here's my lyre. Here's my lyre. Here, here we go with the first, the first poem. Girls chase the violet bosomed muses bright, gifts in the plangent lyre, lover of hymns. Stiffness has seized on these once supple limbs, and black braids with the passing of years turned white. Age weighs heavily on me, and the knees buckle that long ago like fawns pranced nimbly. I groan much, but to what end? Humans simply cannot be ageless like divinities. They say that rosy forearmed dawn, when stung with love, swept a sweet youth to the earth rim. Tythonus, even the even their age withered him, bound still to a wife forever young. That's the end of that that lyric. Um, now I'm going to go. That that was from from the uh, the first book, the the Puchigan translation. Now I'm going to the rest of these I'm going to read from the Anne Carson translation. So here's the first one. Stars around the beautiful moon hide back their luminous form. Whenever all full she shines on the earth, silvery. And that's the end of that one. Roman Emperor Julian actually mentioned this one in a poem. So I found that interesting. But uh, from what the, the notes I read on this one, stars around the beautiful moon hide back their luminous form. So this, uh, uh, perhaps talking about the bride and when she when she comes out for her wedding, all, all those around her kind of fade and, and it's it's like the moon uh, whenever the moon is full the stars around you, you, you can't you can't see those stars they're not as bright uh, just beautiful beautiful poem there the next one what country girl seduces your wits wearing a country dress not knowing how to pull the cloth to her ankles just thought that was kind of kind of funny and, and interesting Here's one that is a fragment, and I want to read this one. I mean, just a, a few lines here, but it's almost just the fragment itself is almost more intense because you're you're inserting your imagination into this poem, and you know that she writes love poems and erotic poems, and so to just have a word every now and then, it's almost like this Mad Libs type of your your imagination fills it in and like what is going on in the rest of this so let me just read this this short one just to give an idea of, of what these fragments kind of look like and in the way that that it's translated is just the, there's these brackets around the parts that we don't that we don't have so here we go in front toward loosen you would be willing slight to be carried and that's it I mean, what, what's, what's all the stuff in between there? I mean, you just think of so many different ways that the, the original poem was. And, it, and I, I loved that. I, I, I kind of like that we don't have the, the full poems here. Next one. Evening, you gather back all that dazzling dawn has put asunder. It's just beautiful. Just beautiful. Next one about the nightingale. Messenger of spring, nightingale with a voice of longing. We read the next one here. This is just a page of a bunch of fragments. So one words or, or uh, a, f- a few words, um, fragments. So l- here, I'll just read a few of them. I would lead. And again, this would, this would be part of a, a, a whole poem. And all we have is I would lead. The next one, wedding gifts. Another one, non-evil. And that one just stuck out to me because... Why is the negative being used here instead of the positive? So instead of saying uh, maybe it's about a person, the person is good, the person is non-evil. 
what, what's the difference there in, in saying that? Maybe it's not even about a person. Maybe it's about a thing that is non-evil. But just that turn of phrase itself, it, it's, it's so interesting. And then uh, another one, and just, just again, on just this one page here, uh, pain giver. So again, these are just one word fragments from these, these poems, just a fascinating idea. All right, if you know Greek, I need you to put on uh, earmuffs for a minute because I'm going to just absolutely butcher some Greek. I don't know how to pronounce this. Uh, this I studied like over 20 years ago. But the point I want to make here is that um, the English translation, translate, it's just one line. So just put on earmuffs for just a, a second. Oh, beautiful, gr oh, graceful one. That is the English translation. Oh, beautiful, oh, grace, graceful one. And, and here is the, the Greek. O, o kala, o, o kairesa, kora. O kala, o kairesa, kora. The, the thing I wanted to get across there is just that constant K sound, the, 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 the beauty of that, and how it, you can't capture that in O beautiful, O graceful one. Uh, and, and again, I deeply apologize to, to everyone who was offended by that that butchering of, of Greek. I'm very sorry, but the point I wanted to get across is, is that constant K and K sound and, and just how, how beautiful that is. I mean, it's a very harsh sound, but like that line is, you can't capture that in English. And so that, that's also what we're dealing with here in, in these, these, these poems is that in the original, it, it's a different experience. And so we have small fragments. Uh, we're reading it in a different language. We're reading it in a, in a translation. And so that's one thing that fascinated, fascinated me about this. And so what I want to do in this section right now is just to compare these tra translations. And so I'm going to read the Puchigan version and then the Carson translation of the same poem. And so this will give you a chance to see which one you like better, see which translation you, you think uh, really captured it. And, and then, um, yeah, that'll just kind of give you a chance to, to, to do that. I, I loved this aspect of it. Um, and I loved reading two different versions just to, it, it also helps you to remember what, what you've read. So here's the first one. Like a gale smiting an oak on mountainous terrain, Eros with a stroke shattered my brain. So that's the, that's the first one. Here's the Ann Carson version. Eros shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. All right, I, I say Ann Carson wins this one because that that imagery. So Eros is the 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 god of passionate love, and it's where we get the word erotic. Eros shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. You just picture this this wind coming down a mountain like a, a strong wind. And, and what that does to a huge oak tree and just how it shakes it and, and it, it almost like shivers, like arrows shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. I, I mean, that, that captures something that like a gale smiting an oak on mountainous terrain, arrows with a stroke shattered my brain. There's some cool parts to that, but I think arrows shook my mind like a mountain wind falling on oak trees. I think that that uh, that wins this round. All right, the next one is here we go. Here's Puchigan's version. The gorgeous man presents a gorgeous view. The good man will in time be gorgeous too. So once again, the gorgeous man presents a gorgeous view. The good man will in time be gorgeous too. Now I'm going to read Ann Carson's version. All right, let me find it. Almost there. Here we go. For the man who is beautiful is beautiful to see, but the good man will at once also beautiful be. For the man who is beautiful is beautiful to see, but the good man will at once also beautiful be. Just interesting how both of those were were translated, but just this idea of, of some someone can be good looking, but um, if the if the man is good as well as good looking, um, there's a, there's a deeper beauty to that. All right, the next next set here. Uh, so here's the Puchkin one, and here we go. 
A ripe red apple grows, the highest of them all, over the treetop, way up on a tapering spray, but apple gatherers never see it. No, rather they do see it is far away. Beyond their reach, impossible. This matter stands just so. That's the Poochigan version. Here is the Ann Carson version. As the sweet apple reddens on a high branch, high in the highest branch, and the apple pickers forgot, no, not forgot, were unable to reach. Which one did you like better of that? Uh, one thing in the Carson translation, she, she makes a note at the end of the book, how she says the word high three times. So as, as the sweet apple reddens on the, on a high branch, high on the highest branch and the apple pickers forgot, she's, she's trying to pull out the Greek where it uses this, um, this, this word three times. And so she's trying to do that with, with the word high in, in that one as well. All right, now I'm going to read my favorite one. And I want you to, to, to ask which one you like the best here as well. Blessed bridegroom, this day of matrimony, just as you wished it, has come true. The bride is whom you wished for. You move gracefully, your eyes are honey. Charm has showered on your radiant face. Yes, Aphrodite granted you outstanding praise. That's the Poochigan version. Here is the Ann Carson version. All right, here we go. Blessed bridegroom, your marriage, just as you prayed, has been accomplished. And you have the bride for whom you prayed. Gracious, your form and your eyes as honey. Desire is poured upon your lovely face. Aphrodite has honored you exceedingly. Again, I'm going to have to give it to Ann Carson on this one. I, I just thought that was so beautiful. I, I, I put a star by I, I almost wanted to just... Um, mark this in a way that I would remember it for letters for people getting married. Cause I just thought that one was so beautiful and such a, such a nice poem. So those were the, some of them that, that stuck out to me. I want to highlight a few ideas and memorable phrases that stuck out to me as well here. So here is, um, one is just one of the ideas that stuck out is is this god Eros, this this ero, er, er, the the god of of passionate love, and how that god changes before and after marriage. And so this is something in the Puchigan book, and this is something that is in one of the comments along with actually the the one I just read about the blessed bridegroom. He says this. Um, Eros, however, ceases to be destructive in a matrimonial context, but is enlisted in the service of the social institutions that make for continuity and stability, end quote. And the thing that stuck out to me uh, uh, about that is the god Eros for a person changes at the moment of matrimony. And so in, in a lot of the Greek uh, writings and 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 again, I'm going to be reading these coming up. But in terms of of what I've read so far in in the notes here, God the God Eros is presented as a destructive God before matrimony. Uh, there's there's this this pull that Eros is 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 trying to to almost lead someone to to destruction in a way if if they if they go full on 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 their, their passions, but within, uh, a matrimonial context, as is stated here, t- uh, Eros, however, ceases to be destructive in a matrimonial context, but is enlisted in the service of the social institutions that make for continuity and stability. Uh, I just thought that was a, a cool thing to think about er- a kind of Eros before marriage and matrimony Eros after matrimony. I just had not thought about that, but but also how it's presented. It's a destructive, it, it can be a destructive force before matrimony, but within matrimony, it's a, it's a constructive uh, role. I want to read one word here in one of these fragments. All right, this, this is so cool. And this, this comes in the notes section of the Anne Carson book. And she's talking about a word that's used Ekpepotamena, ekpepotamena, 
And here's what she says about it. With its spatter of plosives and final open vowel sounds like the escape of a soul into nothingness. And so this poem is about, uh, uh, it, there's a line dead having been breathed out and this word ekpepotamena. Uh, so at the very start of it, it's just like these strong, these strong uh, sounds. And then at the end, it just dies out in mena. And this is an example of, of the types of words that Sappho would use to express these ideas. In the word itself, the the word itself, the word in in the one where I the I, I butchered that uh, that one where you just had the same sound over and over. She's using words as a tool to express emotion, to express what she's thinking, the the passions, the the love, and just how even one word like that, how the beginning can be just heart these harsh sounds just kind of dying out, and that can be like someone dying. I mean, it's just, that's just amazing, but it just, it just puts such depth into this work and how you can just look at one word and have it be that rich, how we only have fragments of her work, but even those fragrance fragments can be so, so rich. I, I really liked that. Let me read a, a, just a few uh, memorable phrases here in, in the second part here. Limb loosening love and Eros was the limb loosener. Uh, so that's pretty descriptive. Uh, and, and yeah, I'll leave it at that. Violet bosomed muses. I, I read that in, in one of the first first ones. That's kind of a, a famous line of, of Sappho's. Rosy fingered dawn and rosy fingered moon. And this was a playoff, uh, a Homeric uh, phrase and used of the goddess dawn. Um, but but I've, I've heard that one before, just rosy finger dawn. And, and so I didn't know it came from, from Homer. And uh, here Saf, Safo must have really liked that as well, because she uses that in a few of her, of her lyrics. Uh, there's another one that says, he is unrivaled like a lesbian. Now, lesbian here is uh, someone from Lesbos. And Lesbos just had a... a uh, Oh gosh, what's the word? It just, it, it was known for, it had a reputation of top musicians. And so this was a saying back then, he is unrivaled like a lesbian. And, and it just means that he is such a good musician. He's like a, a, a musician from, from Lesbos and they are so good. They're like on a different level. So you've got Sappho is from Lesbos and the musicianship there, it, it was just known. It, it was like, it was like the Nashville of the time. Uh, probably not a good uh, connection there, but just it, it was known as the music place and the in the place for music, beautiful music and lyric and and song and poetry. And uh, so that was a famous saying there. There's there's um, uh, another one that kind of goes along with that. Rosy fingered dawn is gold sandaled dawn. I want to close out this this segment here just in asking the question of how the recent publication of Inhedewana's poems has changed the history of, or, or has changed history's view of Sappho, if at all, ha, has it at all. And and so we, Sappho, or in, in Hedawana's writings were recently just rediscovered, probably in the last hundred years. And and then um, Sophus Hell's books book came out in April of 2023, where he has the the new translations of Inhedewana and her poetry. And she's 2300 BC. This is well before 600 BC here with, with Sappho. And so with, with Inhedewana joining the, the mix here, what is that going to do for, for our view of Sappho going forward? We have more, from what I can tell, we have more of Inhedewana's writings just because they were done on clay tablets. They were not done on papyrus. And so we have more of Inhedewana's. There are some similarities in, in the hymn aspect of it and the entreaty to God, uh, God's in, in Hedawana's writings, uh, that, that is, is similar to Sappho. So I, I'm just curious if, if we'll see some books come out in the, in the near future, comparing these two, I think in terms of seem, Sappho seems to have had 
more of an influence and has, had been referenced more. It's almost like we lost in Hedawana for 2000 years or so. And, and it, she's just coming back to us. Whereas Sappho has been there. She's been beloved by, by many. So I, just a curiosity of mine to see if, um, if, if those two will be compared uh, going into the future here. All right, now into segment three in my one thing. The one thing I'm still thinking about after reading through a couple books here of Sappho's poetry. And it's it's this, just that idea I mentioned earlier that there was a shift from the Homeric epic to the Greek lyric. The, the epic about gods, about these kind of larger than life stories, these myths moving to a Greek lyric where it's a very personal experience. It's about love. It's about, uh, it's about feelings, emotions, and it's this move from myth to the everyday, the, the, the life. And so I, I like noticing these, these shifts. Uh, I mean, I didn't notice it, but I, I, I read about it in, in this one, but just this shift between Homer and Sappho and how that was moving in a direction. And that's moved in a direction that's, that impacted literature after, after that, uh, just moving from that myth to about gods to, to kind of personal lyric and how we even have the word lyric still in, in use today. And, um, it's just it's it's neat that that that's the main thing that has stuck out to me about uh, in learning about Sappho. I mean, I I really enjoyed her her poetry as well. I I have trouble with poetry. I don't I don't understand it very well, and so I I really tried. I I tried to take it slowly. In the Puchigan version, I would read the poem, then I would look at his notes, and then I would go back to the to the lyric poetry and and read it again. And I would I, what's what's neat is. You, you, it does help to have that understanding of Greek mythology before you go into this, because some of her poems just, they reference gods and they reference them in a way that you need to know the backstory. So that's my one regret is not having waited to read Sappho until I read Homer and until I read, uh, I've got a book coming up about Greek mythology. So I wish I would have read that first just to kind of have more of that background. But if you have that background and you've never read Sappho, you you should give her, give her a try. Um, I, I would recommend getting two versions of the book as well, just to have that comparison. It'll help you to remember. And then you, it's just fun to read different translators notes as well on, on these works. Some of, some of the notes overlap, but uh, you do get a, a few different voices in, in there as well. Uh, I, I was amazed at the power of language, words, and sounds in, in this, in Sappho's works. And I was amazed by how much could be accomplished in a word, a word that is all we have of a poem. And yet that, that word itself can, can spark interest and intrigue and just why was this word chosen? What was the context around it? Uh, it that, that was so fascinating to me. It's just that we have these fragments and yet the fragments themselves are, are, are magical in a way. So to recap, I, I really enjoyed the study of Sappho. There, there is this mystery to it. Uh, I know her poetry has been beloved for 2,500 years, but the fact that we only have 10% of it and nearly all of it in, is in fragments adds to the allure of it. There's also this hope that, that I have that I've shared in other episodes, especially with some of the, um, the works from Mesopotamia and, and that, are, that are in cuneiform, is that the hope that we may discover it someday. Uh, especially with the cuneiform tablets, there's a bunch of those in museums that, that have just never been been read. Uh, what if there? What if we come across some other papyrus, or there is some papyrus in museums that I mean, just the latest discovery was in 2004, in in Cologne, and they they discovered another part of of Sappho, some 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 poems that that we didn't have that full of a version of. And so what if there's more of that? I mean, that was just 19 years ago. So what, what if there's more of that, that we're just, that we're just waiting to discover? Uh, what if there, what if someday we have all of Sappho's entire poem, poems together? Uh, that would just be incredible. But just that hope itself is, is kind of neat to, to think about. 
Uh, these, give, these lines have given words to the feelings of philosophers, emperors, and everyday people for centuries. Uh, in these two books that I read, I came across a number of books that are on my great books list that reference Sappho. So to me, that is the coolest thing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be seeing Sappho's name. I mean, we're talking Middlemarch by uh, Eliot, uh, right, Eliot? Um, so that's, that's a book coming up, and, and, and in that book, is mentioned Sappho. There's men, and there's even parts where uh, lines from Sappho are mentioned without even saying Sappho's name. And so I, I just I can't wait to to get into some of these later works where it's referencing this. And and that's why I want to read these books in order just to to see that that line that continuity come through. These are so short that I, I would suggest um, getting a couple translations, reading through it, taking it slowly. Uh, that that uh, slow reading will reward richly. All right, that's going to do it for this episode. Thank you for listening. I would love to hear from you. You can email me at eric at booksoftitans.com to let me know what you thought of this episode or other ones. You can follow Books of Titans on Instagram or Twitter. And I. you can also go to the Books of Titans website, just booksoftitans.com. I'll be back next week to discuss another book or series from my 2023 reading list. And until then, keep reading, keep learning, and keep listening. I'm out.